right. Good evening, everyone. So nice to see everyone here in Zoom. So this is the first time I do um, this, not from the library, but from our own home. <laughs> so uh, it's a good experience. Yeah, hopefully it will run smoothly today. And so today we're very lucky to have uh, David with us again. So I think uh, all of you should know David by now, but if there's someone new here, uh, let me just give a very brief introduction about David. David Orose is our guest teacher today. So David is a spiritual teacher and he's an experienced leader of meditation groups, both from, from in Sydney and as well as in Hong Kong. So his approach is utterly simple, natural, and it's a discipline of ease in practice. David always say effortlessly. <laughs> okay, whatever we do, we do effortlessly. Yeah, that's very nice. So according to David, the living experience of a meditative approach to everyday life is the one aim of practice. So the reward of this simple practice are beyond words, according to David. So David, thank you so much today um, for being here. So to ease our tension during this uh, lockdown period. <laughs> so David will be uh, giving us a talk on lockdown management, the Buddhist way. So just give a virtual applause to David. Hi, David, thank you. <laughs> Lovely introduction. Thanks for your generous words, Meredith. And in fact, you're such a good student. You said uh, basically all I'm going to be saying. I think I can go home now. <laughs> so uh, well done. And I always appreciate everything you do to, to make this happen, to get us here. <clears throat> and Kynan, thank you so much. And welcome, everybody. Um, this is my first time Zooming from home. Uh, with with the with the buddhist group so um, i'm looking forward to experience this and hopefully get you know quite adept at it after a while so we can look forward to doing this from time to time so we never know what's in front of us so at the moment our topic is um and meredith's come up with this catchy title lockdown the buddhist way i love it <laughs> so as i began to think about this topic um i I began to look at the word lockdown, and of course, it's got a quite a negative connotation, hasn't it? Um, but um, is as the Buddhist way is to look at everything as a pair of opposites and find the sort of middle way. So if we start to look at the word lockdown, it's the key to what how we can begin to handle ourselves and manage the lockdown, because uh, that which is locked is not open by definition. We have to unlock, we have to open, and we'll explore that a little bit. What is? What do I mean by opening? And instead of locking down, we open up. So what is it that we need to open up in lockdown in order to get through this difficult time? And, and to, who knows, you know, it may happen from time to time. So we need to develop some skills that we haven't really honed perhaps so much in the past. So most of us metaphorically live in a small room within the mansion of our being. We, even in everyday life, we go around and we're, we're pretty much living in a contained way. In a, most of us live you know, under the radar, so to speak, we keep things safe and we work within our comfort zone. And there's always opportunities for everybody to, to ask themselves the question, could I be a little more open here? Could I be a little more present here? Could I be a little more trusting and uh, open to the love that's available and the truth that's available in this moment? So this really is the key to managing lockdown, is to see it not so much as a way of, of locking ourselves down into one of those little rooms in the mansion of our being, but to begin to open up to the limitless resources of our Buddha nature. 
And that's the truly amazing experience as we start to explore the way. And I'm going to read to you the Dogen's, uh, basically the summary of the Buddhist path here, which is, it's a beautiful saying. And I think Meredith's going to help me by putting this uh, perhaps on your screen. So we look at it together. The, to study the way of the Buddha is to study the self. To study the self is to forget the self. To forget the self is to be actualized by myriad things. When actualized by myriad things, your body and mind, as well as the bodies and minds of others, drop away. No trace of enlightenment remains. And this no trace continues endlessly. That's really quite profound. I'm just going to say it again one more time. To study the way of the Buddha is to study the self. To forget the self is to be actualized by myriad things. When actualized by myriad things, your body and mind, as well as the bodies and minds of others, drop away. No trace of enlightenment remains. So we can look at this now together and start to unpack what, what's this really all about? Because it's regarded as the essence of the Buddhist way. So the Buddha said that all we have to do to really become awake as the Buddha did is to really know ourself, to study, if you like, in a very special way, this fathom long body is you call it everything that we need to know is right here and i like to think that when the buddha sat down under the bodhi tree he was in a sense in lockdown he'd shut out all distractions and he made a very clear uh, statement of aditana of determination that he was not going to get up until he was awakened until he was enlightened. So he's our first teacher for lockdown. And what he did was to really listen to the self, not himself, but to the self. It's in a sense, it's answering the question, who is this self really? And not just who, but what is it? And the moment we ask that question, the mind will like to answer it. But of course, the mind is not the one that becomes awakened. The awakening occurs prior to the mind. The mind arises in the awareness that is Buddha nature. So the first thing is to know that when we ask the question, who am I? What is this self? We then pause. And every answer that comes up is going to be some description. Initially, it'll be something like, I am David, or you know, I am Meredith, or whatever that uh, takes us to. And then I am whatever I am, my job, or whatever we can start to describe things. But this is just uh, pointers. And we, as soon as we have the mind's answer, we drop it straight away. So we, we drop the self, we forget the self. Every definition of the self is not the self. And we, we are not that which we commonly hide under the label of who we think we are. And we come to a place of actually not knowing. And this is important to understand. The, the not knowing of which I speak is a opening. It's the antidote to the lockdown. It's an opening to the unknown, which is limitless, boundless being, or Buddha nature, or emptiness. All of these words are describing something which cannot actually be named in words. Although the word Buddha nature or the word awareness 
really takes us into the experience of that which is being sought. Because all of us have an intuitive understanding of what that is to, to really be aware. And to be aware of being aware is really a profound, in a sense, achievement, but it's letting go of any striving to be totally present as we are. So then we've, we've studied the self by the next step to forget the self. These two are the, the most important steps. And not just forget the self, but to also, as the Buddha did, just sitting under that tree in lockdown, he also, for, for the time being, he took his attention away from the outer world. And this is, this is one of the important steps in, and in meditation as we're going to be doing later on. We, we concentrate on what's more apparently within. So this is the first step is to separate ourselves off from all the, the so-called uh, body, world, mind, all the things that are happening there. And we begin to open up to this richness of boundless, limitless, emptiness within. Following that process, there's a return. The Buddha eventually, when he became awakened, he was then open to everybody and the world. And in the, the ox herding pictures, he goes into the marketplace with bliss bestowing hands. Everything he touches, he touches and induces realization by his very presence in other words the the openness that he is is infectious everywhere he goes people begin to let go of their worries and concerns and open up so this is the two-way path of understanding firstly to go within and say i am not that i'm not that i'm not this and then gradually we come to that place of emptiness and then we start to move back out into the world. And what we see in the world, again, as we've forgotten the self as it manifests in the inner sense of the self, everything that we see outside is also me. There is no separation. So I want you to imagine now that, for example, your sitting in the middle row of a cinema and there on the screen is the movie being played and it's all exciting and there's lots of busyness going on and as you're looking at that you get sort of absorbed into it and you you sort of lose yourself to some degree now i want you to imagine that you part of you now sort of separates out from that body that's sitting in the middle seat and sits in the back row in this sort of premium seat of pure awareness. So this is the place where you're actually able to look at that person in the middle row and also all the events that are occurring on the screen and see them as this is, this is appearing in me awareness you see so this is this is a exercise of of just opening ourselves to the possibility that this body that appears and this world that appears is appearing in me as emptiness as awareness and all of these myriad things are actually not separate from me and the moment we have that realization and we realize that every person, every animal, every sentient being, every flower, everything is actually the same as this being. In quantum field theory, all the little tiny subatomic particles and gluons are all just in various stages of spin coming in and out of manifestation continually. And that's the essence of this apparent human, which is not really 
if we look at it deeply, is just the same as all of that out there. It's made of the same thing. So we are literally one. Now, in a short sentence of Dogen, he's taken us from this narrow definition of the self that I thought I was, that was locked down into a very small room in our huge mansion. And he's opened it up by forgetting the self and opening up to the realization that we are one. And through that portal, love flows because we recognize our oneness. And truth flows because there's no hiding from anything. It's, it's all is truth and beauty. So all the realization of emptiness is form and form is emptiness occurs in this one pithy verse. To forget the self is to be actualized by the myriad things. In other words, we come to awakening by all those many things that we previously thought was objective reality. In essence, it's the same as me. When I make contact with that flower, either in perception or touching it or smelling it, I'm transported into, if I'm really open, to the emptiness which is prior to that form. And I can touch presence in its pure form, everything that I see. And I don't even have to walk outside. I can pick up my cup and I can hold it and know that this too is me. The way, the way it feels now becomes different. It becomes precious. It becomes a thing of beauty and no different from this one. So there's no room for self-criticism, for separation of any sort. It's liberation as, as this understanding deepens. And we start, once the seed is planted, it ripens into a huge tree. When actualized by the myriad things, your body and mind, as well as the bodies and minds of others, drop away. That's what I've been saying here. That's what he means. It, they drop away from being seen as something formed and permanent to a dance. We're seeing a dance of being, and I am that dance. And this liberating insight is that which really is the answer to lockdown. In my little room, in my little house, everything I need is right here. When I'm doing the dishes, which I do a lot of in this house, I find that I can enter into a meditative state and just by being very attentive to the feel of all the, the china and the utensils, I can really appreciate in a, in a very profound way this experience and, and, this, and with gratitude, this opportunity to really deepen this understanding that everything I'm touching and caring for is like a wiping a baby's bottom, it's so beautiful. And the presence, it's almost as if I can feel the cups saying so nice to be washed in this way. And so there's a, there's a sort of a mutual effect. It's not just me giving that presence. It's something which is given back to me so that the universe starts to actually enter me. It starts to be felt as if it's coming to me. I don't have to go out to it. Everything is a gateway to this understanding. No trace of enlightenment remains. This is important to understand because the goal of enlightenment can be the biggest impediment to awakening because we're striving. We're, we're trying to be something other than what we are. But the truth is we are already that which we seek. 
we don't have to go anywhere. We don't have to really do anything. We just have to be present, be here now. Present moment, beautiful moment, as Thich Nhat Hanh would say. And this no trace continues endlessly. It's outside time, it's outside space. It has no limits, it is boundless. And that's in, in that short sentence, to study in that short paragraph, to study the self is to forget the self. To forget the self is to be actualized by myriad things. When actualized by myriad things, your body and mind, as well as the bodies and minds of others, drop away. No trace of enlightenment remains. And this no trace continues endlessly. So it's a beautiful introduction to what I want to expand now, and hopefully that's begun to make you wonder and start to look at things a little differently. And I'd be interested at this point to ask, to open up to see if there are any questions about that particular verse. If anybody would like to share or comment, this would be a good opportunity. Looks like everybody's attained the place of silence. It's <laughs> probably not such a bad thing. So I can go on. I just don't. I want to make sure that I haven't left anyone behind. If you have any, any need to sort of ask questions about that, feel free to at any point. So okay. So I'll, I'll keep going, and now I want to talk about the the essence of what it means to be the Buddha or a Buddha, and I've chosen to focus on the quality of bodhicitta, which is the essence of, of the compassionate heart, the generosity and the gratitude that flows from bodhicitta is the quality that seems to emerge quite naturally from having really understood that verse that I've described, which is really the essence of the lockdown management teaching that out of this bodhicitta starts to flow. It's almost like it, you can't stop it. It's for the phrase that uh, Meredith kindly reminded us all, it's effortless. <laughs> it just wants to happen, just like a waterfall flowing over the edge of the cliff. It just flows into life. And so we find that in, in very simple ways, our life begins to change and we can, you know, we can walk along the street and our face is open and engaging and the smile can be just a very soft little smile, but it, it's a signal to others that um, I'm, I'm open, I'm not a, a danger to you. And it's amazing how many people will spontaneously smile. I've noticed that when I'm really open in this way, that um, so many people are, are kind to me and just in the kindness of strangers is something that this is much more obvious to me. And so this, this generosity and this opportunity to share the teaching, it's so many different ways to be open to what wants to happen in any particular moment and to respond quite naturally from our deep nature. Is, is really one of the, the, the main fruits of, of this teaching. So that everything starts to come towards you because there's an openness in the heart which invites and welcomes people. And so it can be you know, the, the natural capacity to respond to what's needed in the world. And in this time of lockdown, of course, there's so many people who are doing it tough. I mean, really tough. So many stories of people who are having mental problems and having physical problems and, and, um, and even illness, and, which is just uh, beyond their capacity really sometimes to contain in the heart. So we have to really be just totally open to be able to relate to everything and 
important to know also there's times when sometimes we, we have to go back to touching in this place of openness and to switch off all the input from the television and the radio and so on it can be quite bombarding so that we can cultivate these qualities that I've been speaking of. Now I, I want to share with you a poem by EQ and I think Meredith might have a copy of this. So yes, this is it. EQ is a Japanese Zen master and he says, Every day, priests minutely examine the law and endlessly chant the complicated sutras. Before doing that, though, they should learn how to read the love letters sent by the wind and rain, the snow and the moon. Every day, priests minutely examine the law and endlessly chant complicated sutras. Before doing that, though, they should learn how to read the love letters sent by the wind and rain, the snow and the moon. About a couple of weeks ago, up here in, in Katoomba, um, went to bed at night and as usual in winter, it was mighty cool. But I was surprised to wake up the next morning and find a beautiful blanket of snow all over the place, all over the garden and you know what it looks like and uh, all the little branches were covered in snow. And I just felt like a little child looking out the window as if I've seen snow for the first time. Absolutely wonderful. And indeed a, a love letter. It was, it was just uh, something that just took my breath away and just brought me totally into the present moment of, of how delightful this gift of the snow is and then almost I think it was the next day as I was looking out out the balcony the full moon and it was just so beautiful and, and open and yellow and and again just just to really be able to recognize these love letters that Nick you talks about and to to be touched by them and there's plenty of wind and rain up here as well. So this, this is why I chose to live up in the mountains because there's a vast open sky, but it doesn't have to be, uh, you don't have to go to the mountains to, to experience this. This is everywhere we look, we, we've got the elements around us and we can start to just be responsive to these love letters. But notice that in this poem, he doesn't say, he says, every day priests minutely examine the Dharma and endlessly chant complicated sutras. He says, before they, they do that, they should learn to read the love letters. In other words, to really touch their essential nature, which really is essentially love, which is the, the, the absence of any separation between me as a subject and that as an object. So this love is the essential first experience. From there, we can then examine the Dharma. We can then chant these sutras, which have their own beauty. These, these rituals connect us to something profound and they too are the truth and, and in a sense, they're also love, but the primary experience is this very simple experience of opening to what's present from moment to moment. So with that, I'd like us to, to do some sitting now. And so I'd like you just to take your seat and uh, just wherever you are, just find a place that you can maintain comfortably for around about 20 minutes and I'll just sound a bell softly to begin our meditation.
So as we begin to sit, and we see a lovely image of the Buddha in Ojasala just sitting. We might ask ourselves, why do we do this? Why sit? And it's a very good question. And it's important to know that in sitting, we're not just sitting. We're entering into an experience of simplicity and being. This is the portal. And, and when we're sitting, it's not just this body which is sitting. Everything is just sitting. The flower is just sitting there, being a flower. The dog is just there, being a dog. And even when it's moving, it's still sitting in its essential nature. It's still entirely natural. And this is what we experience when we just sit. Just sitting doesn't mean just staying stuck in the one place. When we're walking, eating, loving, whatever we're doing, we're still just sitting. So I want you now just to remember why we do this as we now enter into the experience of letting go. More and more completely.
ease in my body. Ease in my mind. Effortless. The breath rising and falling by itself. Peace will we experience as we sit in repose becomes joy and celebration of life and movement. So as we begin to move out of meditation and open the eyes, we can notice the heightening of our awareness, our perception, just from diving deeply into stillness. So welcome back everybody and I'd like to now just after you've just spent a moment now just sitting and recognizing the clarity that comes from just sitting clarity of mind and heart feelings are calm and out of this pool of stillness we may find there are something that we want to share or some comments or questions. And I'd like to suggest that if you find that any question or comment, don't hesitate to share because this is a, something in lockdown we need to learn from each other. And so I'd be very interested in how other people are, are managing. So I'm just speaking to see if that's working. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Sue. <laughs> okay. And uh, uh, David, I'd just like to say in terms of how I'm managing lockdown is that the thing I find about lockdown is it, it's quite isolating. You know, suddenly all of those things that you 
did during the day that involve other people get taken away. And so I'm really grateful that you're teaching tonight and that we're all here. Um, you know, connecting via Zoom is never the same as connecting in person, but it's better than not connecting at all, that's for sure. So I love the Dogen teaching. I, I'm, Bunke has used it before and I'm very fond of it. But so thank you for bringing it again. Thanks. I think we in Australia is still um, very lucky. I, I think although it's locked down, but it's not that you, you can't go everywhere. I mean, like you can still go out for a walk and, and things like that. It's compared to many other countries that they, um, you, you, they, you can't walk the dog. <laughs> you can't just go out, you know, exercising. So I, I think we're still very lucky to be here uh, in Australia. Oh yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for that. Um, hi, David, I, I want to um, thank you for the talk and how I'm traveling in lockdown is particularly well. I'm one that is normally incredibly active and the slowing has been most beneficial for me. I was relating to the washing up and I live alone, so I, I do all, the, all of the washing up, but in being, you know, connected with the China or looking, uh, enjoying the, the warmth of the water on my hands, I started practicing under Ayakema and Prakantipalo 40 years ago this, this December. And what I found just in the last couple of weeks is that my practices are getting back to what they used to be of an hour. I'm feeling very centered, um, very grateful. I would like to say I'm exceptionally grateful because my timing was implicit last Thursday. I'm adopted, but I have two sets of parents that are 96, 97, 97 and 98. And I picked up, I picked up the older two in Rockdale last Thursday, drove them to Palm Beach where we had lunch. And it was my want to drop in on my other set of parents in Narrabeen. And so I had my four nonagenarians together and just for the sake of the exercise, I iced a cake and pretended it was my birthday three weeks early. They say happy birthday and um, <laughs> it was just, it was just, it was just precious. And I will say that, you know, the original set of parents maybe weren't as well suited for one another. But what I was able to witness was my dad, when we were leaving, give my mum a really lovely big hug and a squeeze and held her for maybe a minute or two. And it was beautiful. You know, I took pictures and videos. I didn't have my camera on then, but it's richly embedded in, in my heart. And one other lovely thing that happened today, I. I did ride my bicycle in my time where I'm allowed out. I live in Lilyfield and my grandchildren are in America. <laughs> anyway, they're, they're three this month and 19 months. And I'd hoped to be there for Charlotte's third birthday, two days before my 63rd. And anyway, it wasn't meant to happen. So my acceptance is lovely, but riding along this boy with a big beamed smile and great excitement. He must've been eight. He saw me and he called out, Grandma, Grandma on a bicycle. <laughs> and I thought, yes, I am a grandma and I'm on a bicycle. And it landed in my heart. It really just landed with me so beautifully. And I called back, yes, I'm a grandma. My grandchildren are in America. I love being mindful. I, I love the moments that come to me. I am someone that smiles at many people 
and many people smile to me. I'm a, I'm a joyous being and I am landing more deeply and softly within myself in this lockdown. And it's lovely to be here and it's lovely to, to just be able to speak my truth of uh, joy and, and deep contentment. Namaste. Thank you so much, Natalie. That's um, certainly landed here in this awareness. And, and I imagine the whole pond has just been touched by that joy that you've celebrated. And what a marvellous story of your longevity, Grandma, <laughs> and also, you know, your, your parents. I mean, that's just extraordinary. And, uh, and, and so delicious the way that you, you really appreciate it. I love that so much. Thank, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. It's beautiful. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, this is my first time, so I thought I'd say, hey, say hello. So hello. thank you, David. Nice to meet you. Yeah. I, live, I live down in Wollongong, so I've been to Graham's Zooms before, but not this one. But yeah, I'm, I'm doing all right in lockdown as well. The only thing I really miss is the swimming pool. But apart from that, my life is pretty much the same because I was working from home teaching at uni. And um, I still, I've been catching up with some friends for just a little walk outside. So we just, yeah, talk with the distance between us. So it's going well. Great, yeah. It's, I think we Buddhists have, uh, our nature is just, you know, it's just a retreat, isn't it? It's just, you know, same old, same old in a way. So, uh, but it's uh, it's great that you can just uh, enjoy it as it is and not wish it was something else. I mean, that's the thing, you're not resisting it. Yeah. So you can just let it, let it be. It's wonderful. Thank you, Helena. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I'm Melanie. I have attended a few of your sessions online before, but um, I'm up in Newcastle. We're doing lockdown light. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to. One of the things I find. <laughs> one of the things I find about um, uh, just lockdown generally, and also just the general vibe of the last year is how important it is for me to be able to join with other practitioners and um, even on Zoom, um, I was able to go to uh, my first in-person retreat down at Sanataram um, at Bundanoon uh, over the VSAC period. And it really brought home to me the importance of what uh, the head monk uh, Pramana says is our Dharma friends and how important the energy we get from Dharma friends, well, uh, can be. And that, um, you know, there might be 20 participants, but the energy that 20 participants, even on Zoom, can bring to one's practice is far in excess of what <laughs> 20 beings. It's like we tap in to all other beings that are practicing or are on a dharma path or or just trying to be kind to others or show compassion but um so tonight uh i live on my own and and i'm finding the thursday night sessions when i can attend online are very valuable and but tonight especially i think um your session and just the the vibe <laughs> um, has been very welcome and um, just the energy of being able to sit with feelings but not alone, although alone, <laughs> um, just makes it that little bit more, not easier, but just less lonely, just less, just the energy for me is important to be able to just give me that motivation to continue to practice, to continue to try and sit, even though I don't have Dharma friends that I can connect with during lockdown. Um, um, Zoom's great, but 
Um, and I do feel connection through Zoom. I think it's a wonderful medium, but um, so many of us, I think, are on our own, practicing on our own. So opportunities like this, and especially the uh, opportunity to, to share and to hear lovely stories about bicycling and smiling. And I very much value it. And so really value your talk tonight, the guided meditation. I love the idea of appreciating what's just around us before we studied the suttas. That really rang a lot of bells for me. <laughs> I've seen that too often, I think. So thank you. Thank you, Melanie, for your your lovely sharing. And um, yes, I, I think uh, you're, you're absolutely right that when, when I step up to to sit in this seat, I'm very mindful that it's it's really um, I'm just one of, of of many, and that the the community is really the teaching, just the presence and the willingness to to be present in this way to each other. Such a gift. Thanks for emphasising that. And just to play on words, which I'm sure you've you've thought of as well, is it, it's the word alone. If you say it slowly, all one, and that's you express that very beautifully in your sharing. And so, you know, I can feel the deep connection with you and I'm sure everyone here is. So um, you're one of us. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, unless there's somebody else. Oh, here we are, Faye, yes. Faye would like to say something. Good to see your, your name there, Faye. Are you going to share something with us? Okay, it's lovely. Thank you for giving the talk, David. It was good to see that your name popping up on the um, <laughs> speaker, speaker list. I was really looking forward to it and not disappointed. Um, in terms of lockdown, I think um, my husband and I are feeling as if a lot is going on the same because we're caught in the middle of moving house, right in the middle of lockdown. And believe it or not, nothing is held up. Not one single thing. Movers are essential workers. And in New South Wales, you're allowed to travel from one home to another. So we're just getting on with it. And to be honest, I'm not feeling... Um, alone like I had towards the end of last year because you can't actually do a lot of other when you're having to pack. So I suppose I'm just a little bit different, but um, the walks getting out into the fresh air is certainly um, an essential. And a little walk along the river goes a long way. So wishing everyone well, and um, keep up your good spirits and lovely smiley faces. Um, it helps. It helps to keep the cheer alive. Thank you. Thank you, Faye, and you've helped to keep the cheer alive, definitely. And yeah, good luck with the rest of the moving. It's uh, seamless. Wonderful, isn't it? Yeah, when you yep. just simply being, things just simply happen. Yep. <laughs> Very nice. Great. Great to hear. Mm. All right. Well, is, is there anybody else who'd like to share anything? If not, I think we'll just bring the meeting to a close. I have a good rest and I hope to see you again next week. Thank you so much, Thank Meredith. You. And so lovely. And I felt uh, the warmth of everyone. And it's amazing how, how deeply we can engage as engaged Buddhists. It's really, this is who we are. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, Sue, too, for your contribution. Oh, thank you, David. <laughs> Thanks very much for your teaching. All right. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night, Good night everyone. Good night. Yes. Rest gently. <laughs>